Uh, my name is Charles Wimmer. I am a uh, service engineer, Yahoo. Uh, I'm going to be talking about case studies of Hadoop operations at Yahoo. Uh, just a couple of things uh, that we've hit, um, probably because of the scale at which we operate. Uh, just some interesting tidbits. Uh, at Grid Operations at Yahoo, we operate about 42,000 nodes. Currently, our largest clusters are around 4,200 nodes. We have 22 clusters spread across uh, four data centers. Uh, a typical installation is a typical configuration is uh, 40 nodes per rack, with a uh, one top of the rack switch. There are some exceptions. We're looking at 12 drive systems, and those are two U per, therefore 20 per rack. Um, Right now, we are about 10 service engineers. Uh, we have people in Sunnyvale and Bangalore. Uh, that's about 4,200 nodes per engineer if you're into that kind of statistic. But once you hit large scales, that number doesn't really mean much. It's, it's, uh, the difficulty scales more with the number of clusters and the number of services, Uzi and H catalog and things. Uh, the service engineers are responsible for Hardware, OS, and Hadoop stack. Uh, we don't do data loading. Uh, we have a separate uh, data loading SE team that's responsible for that. We don't run applications. We don't run the Hadoop jobs. There are application-specific service engineers for that. Uh, we're basically the core grid. We run Hadoop software. Um, just want to note that we are not in data centers. We actually have a separate site operations team that are the hands-on in the data center. Um, quick side note, we're looking for service engineers. If anybody wants a job at Yahoo being root on 42,000 boxes, let me know and I'll get you in touch with the right people. Um, so for each of these case studies, I'm going to talk about the situations we encountered, uh, the root cause we found that caused the problem, how we implemented the solution for it, and also the lessons learned for each of the case studies. So first one I'm going to talk about is hard disk upgrades. So Hadoop has been available within Yahoo for a long time, since about 2006 for research. Uh, some of the current research and production grids, uh, the hardware was purchased as early as 2007, 2008. Uh, the nodes contain a mix of 750 gig and uh, one terabyte disks, four disks per system. And the problem, the, the, the core problem was, you know, these grids are always full. Uh, really the root cause is because Hadoop has been so successful within uh, Yahoo. Uh, we've seen ra explosive data growth, little graph, you know, over the last few years. Uh, that's known as a scary curve to sysadmins. Um, by 2010, the combination of the, the, the cost of hard drives being low enough and our, our need for space, uh, we decided to upgrade disks on these clusters. So the process we used, uh, we decommissioned one to four cabs, one to four racks per grid at a time. The number was based on how much free space was on that uh, grid at the time, on that cluster at the time. Uh, we take the we, do, we add, add the nodes to the exclude list, wait for the decommission to happen, wait for the blocks to replicate off to other clusters. Uh, then we uh, wipe the disks. We write zeros to every sector of the disks. We, uh, we set the nodes to kickstart on next power up, and then we shut the power off. Um, the reason we did this is we, we actually handed off to the separate team, the side operations team. And there's a couple, of th a couple of things here. We wanted to do a cabinet at a time so that there was no accidents made where uh, a, a, a guy touched one machine, but he, wasn't, he was supposed to touch this other machine. And uh, we turned them, turned them off, and that's kind of a, a double check for the side ops team. If they go to the cabinet, they're supposed to upgrade hard drives on, and the lights are still blinking. Uh, that's a big red flag. So the side ops team uh, 
pulled the sleds, replaced the discs, powered on the systems. Since they were set to kickstart by us, the, the OS was installed. Um, then handed it back over to the SE team. We uh, installed Hadoop, added it back to the cluster, and started the balancer to put, put blocks back on the new nodes. Uh, upgrading disks weren't the only solutions we considered for the full grid problem. Uh, one solution would be just to add more nodes to your grid. Um, this is the most simple solution. You need more space, add more boxes. Uh, problem with that is some of the grids we were trying to upgrade were already 4,200 nodes. And we've, uh, we're, with the current generation of uh, MapReduce and HTFS, we're pushing the envelope. So we couldn't really add grids, uh, add nodes to the grids. Uh, and also, it's a, a more expensive solution. Another option we thought about was replacing these four by 750 gig systems with our current generation hardware, which happened to be at the time six by two terabyte systems. Um, this is a fairly easy option. Uh, it's, you know, decommission boxes, pull out hardware, put in hardware. SiteOps does this all the time. Uh, the problem with that is it's the most expensive. You're really throwing away hardware that's perfectly usable. Uh, and that's a problem. Um, so the, cho the choice we made, of course, was to replace the 750 gig drives with two terabyte drives. It was, of course, the cheapest option. Um, here's the pain. <laughs> Massive labor is required. When we turned over you know, a box, or a cabinet to side ops, you're talking four screws per drive, four drives per host, 3,000 hosts. So they, somebody's turning a wrench on 48,000 screws. Um, also, there's a significant amount of overhead in terms of project management. Who's got drive shipping in? Who's got the extra labor on side operations to, to turn the wrenches? Um, and so project management and SE resource was required. Some of the lessons we learned, um, bottom line is it works. Uh, it was uh, not a terribly large capital outlay. Uh, it worked so well that we're actually continuing. Uh, we are upgrading to three terabyte drives now. Uh, we're upgrading one terabyte drives to three terabyte drives this year. Uh, we're planning on upgrading on the order of 25,000 drives. Um, a significant amount of the time of the project was, it was spent waiting for uh, nodes to decommission and for blocks to balance back on. Uh, we sometimes exceeded our change windows because of this. So we've actually asked the HDFS team to uh, give us, so right now the balancer bandwidth is a tunable, uh, but it's a tunable in the configuration file, a configuration file and requires a data node restart. So we've asked the, that it be a, a dynamic tunable, and in other words, be able to run a DFS admin command or something to allow us to change the balancer bandwidth and that be propagated down to all the data nodes. Uh, another time sink was the number of broken hosts we had per cabinet when they were handed back to us. Even though we were only changing the hard drives, uh, other stuff happened. <laughs> uh, either, either, you know, it was a little broken just on the edge of working when it went down or, you know, somebody uh, inserted the disk a little too uh, roughly or whatever happened, a, a component popped loose, cables popped out. So we... Um, about four to eight broken hosts per cabinet. Uh, it is what it is. Uh, so one thing, obviously, working with the side ops, it's, it's best to have changes located in one rack at a time if they're physical changes. Uh, if you don't, then you have, e even though you know, they're making change on one box, they may hit another, or if they may be mislabeled or in the database wrong or something. Second case, uh, BIOS upgrades. So early in 2010, we were adding capacity at a significant rate. Uh, so fast, in fact, that we had a new uh, hardware platform that we couldn't test in our uh, sandbox and research clusters. Uh, there was huge demand for production clusters 
and we needed to, that's the only boxes we could buy, so that's where, where we put them. Uh, we did test on a small scale first. You know, we bought a cabinet of them and ran at, at the 40 node scale. Um, so the old platform was the Intel Harper Town chips, four by one terabyte drives, and the new platform was the uh, Nehalem's with six by twos. Um, the problem we saw didn't, didn't, we didn't see it at first. Over time, the, the, the number of task trackers reporting into the job, job tracker slowly decreased. Um, and, and therefore, the compute capacity dropped slowly over time. So we engaged our kernel team, our internal kernel team, and the vendors of the hardware and started working the problem. Uh, the task tracker process was actually still running, but it was stuck waiting on a few ticks. The kernel team, you know, wrote a debug version of glibc, and we put it on there, and it did some counters. And basically, there's an, uh, an integer that shouldn't be in the state that it's in. Um, in other words, they looked at the software code pass, and they said, "This can't happen. These states cannot exist." So we figured it was a problem with the hardware. Uh, working with the hardware vendors, I'm sure anybody who's worked with hardware vendors, the first question they ask, are you using the latest firmware? Are you using the latest BIOS? Are you using the latest uh, drivers? So and we upgraded the BIOS, BMC firmware, and processor microcode on these boxes, and the problem goes away. Uh, that is to say that the uh, incidence of the problem at the, we were again testing with 40 nodes, the incidence of the problem at the 40 node scale dropped to undetectable levels. Um, so simple, all we had to do now is upgrade the BIOS on 12,000 hosts. Um, so how do we do that? Well, obviously USB stick is impractical. Uh, it would take too much time. Uh, it's error prone. Again, constant coordination would be needed between the side ops and the service engineer. Um, so what we did was we worked at the, the the vendor of the hardware, and they generated a, a Linux image that we could boot via Pixie that installed the BIOS and installed and updated the BIOS settings. Um, this made it automatable; doesn't require side ops to touch each box. Uh, so what we did was we, you know, created a change management window and 125 nodes at a time. We decommissioned the boxes, upgraded the BIOS, put them back into the cluster. Uh, overall, it took about six months. Uh, it was 12,000 nodes on five clusters. Uh, if you see the increase in slope there around Christmas, uh, some of the clusters had less data on them than other clusters. And again, decommissioning time was a significant part of the timeline. And on those nodes that had, on those clusters that had very little data, the decommissioning was quick. So he could rapidly iterate over. Uh, 125 nodes at a time. Lessons we learned from this. Uh, whenever you're doing a, a soft change that involves decommissioning a bunch of nodes from a, a cluster, spread the nodes out across the racks. Therefore, your, your limitation, your, your replication problem is lowered. Your top of the rack switch, instead of using all the bandwidth on one top of the rack switch, you're using bandwidth on top of the rack switches across the cluster. Um, you know, so physical change, one rack at a time, fewer mistakes made, but when you're doing logical changes that require you to put machines in and out, go horizontally. Um, another thing that we do now is every time we deploy hardware, we double check the firmware, uh, make sure that it's tested with the latest version of firmware from the, the vendors. Uh, also, you know, the reason we could do things like hard disk upgrades and BIOS upgrades on running clusters. All these clusters were not down ever because of these activities. That's because of the design of Hadoop. It handles fault tolerance. It's designed to handle fault tolerance. Therefore, we just told it, take the box out, and it did. Uh, this third case is a little more lighthearted. Uh, doesn't sound it, and it really wasn't but it'll be fun. Uh, facilities problems in new data centers. So 
one day, Nagios says, there are several thousand nodes down. Uh, we said, okay, what's going on? We tried to connect to the out of band uh, for the boxes, can't do it. A little while later, the Wynock sends us alerts saying that there are PDUs down in a, in a data center. And then we also saw email traffic about uh, other properties in the same co-location facility that are failing out because they lost thousands of nodes. So I know this doesn't look like facility. Give me a, give me a minute here. Um, a few months before this happened, one of our uh, researchers, Nicholas, uh, ran some code on one of our sandbox clusters that computed the two quadrillionth bit of pi. Uh, it's zero. Um, took 23 days. And the uh, important thing to note about this is uh, the, the, the program to do this is very computer intensive. It can, you, it's very distributable, parallelizable. You can fill up all the slots on a cluster really quickly with this program and do useful work. Um, again, these, th this was a, a new data center, it's new hardware. We were using Nehalem's and Westmere's. Uh, they have great idle power savings. Whenever there's no uh, demand, no processor demand, cores and cache can be powered down uh, and then immediately when demand appears, within cycles, you know, a few cycles, the, the, they can be clocked back up. Uh, this, gr this is great. The side effect to this is uh, there's a significant, unlike the Harper Town, there's a significant difference between idle power draw and fully utilized power draw. Um, so the other component of this problem, um, I've got to tell you a little bit about how we lay out racks in a data center. So we have rows, and within these rows, we have different properties. So in one row, we'll have grid, mail, flicker. So like, say the grid is the dark purple, flicker is pink, and, and mail is orange there. Um, what we strive for is the balanced side there, pretty well distributed. Um, this is a new facility. Uh, we were one of the first adopters. We put a lot of capacity in, you know, right away. So, uh, what ha natural randomness happened to be that we, there were more grid nodes in these rows than anything else. More Hadoop cabinets in these in these rows than anything else. Uh, so, pretty much, there are some many many rows that were unbalanced. So, one day. We told Nicholas that he could run, there were a 3,800 node cluster, hadn't been released into production yet. We told him, sure, go spin the cores. And uh, bottom line is, that cluster happened to be on these cabinets where we were a little unbalanced. The additional power draw that we'd never seen before caused PDUs to overheat and shut themselves down for safety reasons. Uh, so, pi plus unbalanced equals bad. Uh, so obviously the solution that we implemented was uh, side operations, you know, said, okay, we need to rebalance everything. You need to shut down that cab, that cab, that cab, that cab. And we did them a few at a time and, and moved them around so that we actually had good uh, distribution. Obviously the lessons we learned, uh, side ops now does uh, proactive power balancing. So it's one of their periodic scheduled activities. They go and actually measure current draw and sum it up for the PDUs and make sure that they're balanced across the PDUs in the room. That's all I had. Any questions? So the question was, uh, when you're buying new hardware, any reason you're sticking with your current configuration and not going up to 12 or 24 per chassis? Um, we are experimenting with that. We actually have sandbox clusters that are at 12 right now, and I know there's rumblings about higher densities. Uh, two questions, completely unrelated questions. When you went from the 750 gig drive to the 
larger drive, that would have changed the ratio of RAM to disk space. Does that have any impact on the performance? And the second question, um, which relates back to the guy two talks before yours, another Yahoo person who was talking about HDFS reliability, is um, what features built into the hardware do you use to proactively monitor health? Things like temperature, fan speed, smart statistics, that sort of thing. Okay. So, uh, first question, uh, the ratio of disk, disk space to RAM did change. Um, I guess what we found is that there are more, there's, there's more emphasis from our customers on having enough space for their data than there is to have good locality. Uh, we're, they're not complaining about bad performance because of locality. So. The, the driving force the customers are yelling about is more space, so uh, we were willing to take that risk. Second question uh, was about, uh, what was the second question? Built-in hardware monitoring. Um, at this time, you know, thousands and thousands of nodes, uh, we are focusing more on the macro level of monitoring. If a box is down, we fix it. If a box is, per, if a, a user complains about a slow job and we track it down to a box and the box is performing slow, we fix it. Um, we don't currently use the smart monitoring. We've uh, thought about uh, doing some kinds of mining, like uh, mining the syslogs for smart, for, for the messages that the smart tools emit and uh, kind of, you know, daily checking that. Uh, one thing we do is uh, when we bring a node back in, we go through a, a burn-in process. During that burn-in process, we read and write every block on the disk, then check, well, then check smart tools. We spin the CPUs hard for a long time. We read and write the memory for a long time. We check the BMC. We, so during our burn-in process, we, we do that extensively, but not while the cluster is running. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm curious of the clusters that you have or when they're running um, sort of in a CPU bound mode. I know a lot of people's Hadoop jobs are disk bound, but how much of that CPU time do you think is um, compression? And do you, I'm, I'm just sort of curious if you guys have had, if you have had to tune the clusters or used interesting um, compression algorithms compiled in to make that faster. Um. So our clusters in general are not CPU bound. Okay. Uh, we're actually, that's, that's one of the reasons we're looking at uh, higher disk density boxes. Um, you know, we've got our purchasing people saying, you're not utilizing your CPUs. Uh, so we, we aren't utilizing our CPUs, okay. so we haven't been spending any effort on that. We, we do compression. Uh, we, we, actually use uh, LZO, and it's, it's not the, the Java implementation. We use the native. Great. Thank you. You mentioned a lot of uh, metrics that you're mon monitoring that are sort of um, just your regular machine monitoring stuff. Do you monitor anything in particular that's Hadoop specific, you know, name node liveness, balance across the HDFS, et cetera, et cetera? And uh, if you do, then how? So, so what, what kind of metrics did you just rattle off there? I didn't. Uh, just looking at uh, you know the fact that the name node is up and right. that the HDFS is balanced. Uh, any other kind of stuff, job tracker performance. Right. So, we do measure all of that. <laughs> uh, we measure balance. Basically, we have a, a a check that says how many of the nodes are almost full, and if that number gets above a certain percentage, we alarm. We uh, we use the Hadoop metrics infrastructure to emit all kinds of, you know, how many map slots, uh, task completion rates, uh, disk space utilization, I.O. All, basically, we capture everything that the Hadoop metrics infrastructure uh, will emit. Uh, and obviously, the, the, the name node and, and up or down, or how, another thing that we get alerted on a lot is as uh, hardware fails, you know, we have thresholds that say, okay, this cluster is supposed to be 4,200. When 5% go away, that's an alarm, stuff like that. 
First part of the question is, do you use any hardware vendors provided diagnosis tool? I, I, I can't understand you. Any hardware okay. what? Hardware vendor uh -huh. who provides the diagnosis tools. Diagnostic tools? Yeah. Um, I asked about that when I first started, and yeah. I kept getting non-answers, so we basically had to write our own. That's, that's what our burn-in process does. Um, it's, it's not vendor specific. We, so we use commodity ha hardware, right? Mm -hmm. We don't use uh, the high-end redundant, uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. we don't have Dells with Drax in them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so our, 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 our hardware monitoring boils down to smart, uh, smart tools and uh, whatever the BMC says. So whatever the vendor is instrumented to, to indicate to the BMC, we read that. So when we do, when we do burn in, we, we, we read those uh, sources of information. So did you end up writing your own, uh, anything? Do we write our own, is yeah. that what you said? Yeah. Uh, it's, just, it's just a bunch of scripts, uh, okay. the gathering information from tools that you know. SmartD, IPMI tool, it's, it's, it's nothing uh, innovative in that space other than taking the time to script it. You see, well, what kind of uh, tools that you wish the hardware vendor provided for you? What kind of tools do we wish hardware vendors would? Yeah, diagnosis, diagnostic tools. Um, well, I mean, the, the, the diagnostic tools uh, for the, the class of hardware that we buy are never going to be any good because they're not going to put instrumentation on, 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 in the hardware, right? So uh, basically, as long as they emit to the BMC, that's all we can hope for. Thank you. Hi. Uh, question around monitoring. Uh, you mentioned you use Nagios. Uh, what other open source tools do you guys use specifically for Hadoop monitoring? Uh, what open source tools do we use for Hadoop Specifically monitoring? for Hadoop. Yeah. Uh, we don't. We have uh, custom internal tools that we have. Uh, I think that there are people working on open sourcing one of our internal tools. Uh, so listen, watch, watch this space for more information. Part of Hortonworks? No. Uh, probably it'll, it'll come out of because of that, okay. right? The, these guys are used to getting these metrics from this tool. Uh, and once they step outside those four walls, they're not allowed to look at that tool anymore. So. Okay. Uh, so we're looking at open sourcing it. 